There are many voices downstairs in the yard and in the cooking rooms of the first floor as I look out the window and down to the entry. My daughters and I planted palm trees there. One day, they will grow into a lovely grove. In the distance, I can see Susan Philippa Fatio Leongle coming for her weekly visit. We spend time together in the gardens, discussing the news, travels we have planned, and family. Susan dines first with Zephaniah for lunch, and then she and I have an afternoon tea. She is one of the few white women who ask me details of my youth in Africa, about my parents and family, for which my memories are growing harder to discern. Susan is well-read and speaks several languages. She often offers stories of her family adventures. I believe being an African woman, a princess, some call me, makes life here in Fort George more fascinating to Susan. In reality, I have many responsibilities to run this plantation and survive for my children. Susan and I spoke about the place I built for myself across from Laurel Grove, the plantation along the St. John's River to which I was brought when I was just 13. I was so young when Zephaniah bought me, as a slave, on the Cuban docks and took me as his wife. I was pregnant when we reached the shores of Northeast Florida. One year after Zephaniah emancipated me, I moved to Horse Landing on the west side of the St. John's River to gain space and the autonomy I needed. I continued to run many of Zephaniah's affairs as he often traveled by ship to many places. Seminar uprisings became more and more dangerous. A group attacked Laurel Grove and took 40 slaves and killed two of our most devoted. I first met Susan when we fled our homes to save our families during the 1812 Patriot War. Laurel Grove became a fort for the Georgia bandits. They terrorized us 
stole slaves, and consumed all our supplies. Zephaniah was captured initially and pledged to support the rebel cause. He then disappeared, leaving me to coordinate the escape of my children, which I did with the help of a Spanish gunboat captain, Jose Antonio Moreno. At 21 years old, I devised a plan to torch both Laurel Grove and Horse Landing to deprive the thieves of a place to hide and ensure Spanish protection for my family. Eventually, I received a plot of land from Spanish authorities for burning our properties to defeat the bandit patriots, and the U.S. government paid our family damages for losses during those raids. Zephaniah arrived in December 1813 to where we stayed with the Spanish military at Fernandina. I continued with Zephaniah in 1814 to Fort George Island, a place once owned by the leader of the Patriot Raiders, McIntosh. We built a village and series of gardens on this island. It is beautiful, with many places for my two girls to roam near abandoned indigo fields, flowering hills, and an abandoned Spanish mission. Ten years passed since our family stayed at the Spanish fort, St. Nicholas, awaiting the time when the bandits would leave. My oldest son grew and learned trade and skills, but Zephaniah spends more time with other wives. It is the way of all men, save for a few. At 31 years old, I gave birth to John Maxwell. Zephaniah was 60 years old, and he was appointed by President James Monroe to serve on East Florida's Territorial Council. Florida was an American territory, and color lines were deepening. Zephaniah became concerned about our welfare and our assets in Florida. He traveled to the northern states to abolitionist rallies and meetings to understand the change is coming when Florida becomes a state, which is just a matter of time. He heard that the island of freedom, Haiti, was a place where perhaps there will be less violence and uncertainty. Zephaniah heard from the Seminoles, friendly with the Spanish and very skeptical of American agreements, that the Indians intend to fight the new Florida Territory and stop their removal to the West. Zephaniah decides we must leave for Haiti now. Another Seminole War is likely and more laws for colored people in Florida will make it dangerous for us all. The president of Haiti met with Zephaniah, and it is decided that our oldest son, George, will be the first to move to Haiti, which means we will sell Fort George Island to Zephaniah's nephew. Eighty of our slaves are moved to another nephew's plantation, Charles McNeil. Zephaniah sailed to Haiti with George, arriving to Cabaret Harbor in 1836 cultivating land for corn, sweet potatoes, yams, rice, beans, plantains, oranges, and all sorts of fruit trees. Two years later, we sail. John Maxwell, Zephaniah's other wives and children, and George's wife, Anna Toile, for Haiti. Martha married Oran Baxter, shipbuilder and planter, and Mary became the wife of John Samus, a merchant sawmill owner and planter. Both are successful white men of Scottish ancestry, and my girls will remain in Florida with them. In Haiti, there are many superb and costly old plantations. Buildings of brick and stone together with valuable mill streams and water privileges convenient to towns purchased for a small part of what improvements would cost. The title of the 35,000 tract of land known as Mayorazgo de Coca, located at the eastern end of the island, is placed in George's name. Flowers are so beautiful and fruits so delicious that you can't refrain from stopping to eat till you can eat no more. A beach cottage at Cabaret Village is where I go to relax, wearing long gowns and gold jewelry, similar to the women I remember from my youth in Jolof, Africa. Within five years, Zephaniah is convinced he will die soon. In 1843, he sails to New York, bidding us all farewell. 
he divided the land at Cabaret Creek among us and placed George in charge of the plantation. If I leave the island of liberty, I shall forfeit all rights and shares of proceeds from the properties in Haiti. Although I live in comfort on Cabaret Island, I decide to return to Florida in 1846. I am 50 years old and a widow. George dies in a shipwreck within weeks of my arrival in Florida. He was going back to Haiti for meetings in New York. Zephaniah's younger sister contested his will, leaving most of the Florida properties and assets to me and my children. I must accept Mary's white husband, John Samis, as my guardian. This is required by Florida law for all freed colored people. We will fight for the rights to the Florida properties and assets that are contested to get the matter settled in our favor. I purchase a 22-acre farm on the east bank of the St. John's River. It will become a small community of free Negroes called Chesterfield. We will begin to plant crops and work the land with 15 slaves. Isabella, John Maxwell's daughter, comes to live with us as things become much more difficult all around for us Negroes. In Haiti, there is new violence and it is dangerous again. We continue to emancipate slaves for service or receive half of their value for freedom, maintaining homes for them at Chesterfield, despite laws that forbid free Negroes to remain in Florida more than 30 days after emancipation. John and Mary's children are tutored at the compound and sent to finishing schools. John became an ardent union supporter when I moved to a small property near my daughter Martha, who became a widow in 1847. Isabella, my sweet Bella, my granddaughter, and I share a room. By 1860, Mary and Martha have only 12 slaves from 150 slaves a year earlier. We sell off all we can to raise money for uncertain times ahead. Now 67, I have no land and only four slaves and dictate my last will and testament a year before we all must flee again when the American Civil War breaks out. John Samus refused to subscribe to $10,000 worth of Confederate war bonds. His property could be confiscated and he could be hung Union troops were stationed here briefly. We thought we would be spared, but they withdrew and we fled to New York. We returned to Fernandina, the same place we sought refuge from the Patriot War bandits 50 years later. The Civil War is over and the Union has won. And in that same year, Martha's St. Isabel plantation burns to the ground and her health is fading. John Samis was elected as one of the six delegates to the Republican Party Convention from Florida who voted for Abraham Lincoln to become the presidential candidate. We, the Baxters, Samis, and Kingsley clans plan a grand homecoming in 1865 at Mary and John's home. Within a few years, several other Negro investors bought John's land and the free black community was expanding with land deeds to prior enslaved and free Negroes. We suffer a series of devastating family deaths in the coming years, including my daughter Martha's death, February 14th, 1870. I lived a long life and enjoyed many places, but by far, the period of rest and most joy was where I raised my children with so many memories of my house, Mam Anna's house.
Thank you. 